So how do we collect data in our studies? There's lots of different ways you can go about this. I mean, you can observe behavior, record behavior. You could ask people about their thoughts, uh, look at uh, self-report measures. You can ask people to identify their own behaviors. Um, like if you're looking uh, to see how much uh, college students drink, you could just ask them a question. How many alcoholic drinks have you had in the past week or 30 days something like that behavioral measures look at uh, again behaviors are overt actions that we can uh, record we could do direct observation this is you might go in you could uh, watch a student in a classroom again that's a good example um, you could watch a rat in a cage watch how they move around you might have a camera or like a GPS system that records data. Um, we, there's pill bottles that have uh, caps on them that count how many times you open it to assess like medication compliance. There's all sorts of different things. Naturalistic observations are uh, viewing naturally occurring behaviors without attempting to change or interfere. You can look at archival data um, when I did my dissertation, I used archival data. So I took records uh, and I took the information from those records from a child psychology clinic. Um, you could look at birth or death records, weather reports, voting patterns, all sorts of stuff. I mean, you could use medical records. I mean, sometimes it's hard to access that information. Sometimes it's very easy. A case study is another type of study, and this is really interesting. A lot of people will kind of uh, reject case studies, but they're really, really important. Um, I think that some of the greatest discoveries come from case studies. Case studies should be uh, used to draw information to develop further intensive studies. Um, so a couple of neurologists that uh, write about case studies are Oliver Sacks and uh, V.S. Ramachandran. Those are interesting authors if you're interested in this. They'll write intensively about one individual. Sometimes it's a small group of individuals. But that leads to bigger research questions. Now, in the area of research, we talk a lot about ethics. And research ethics are very important. Um, as part of this class, if you're a NOVA student, you might also complete the city training instead of research participation. City training is all about ethical issues in research. So I don't like you to do that before you go over this chapter. You'll get more out of it. A lot of things have been done in the field of psychology in the research area that are unethical. This is a picture of the Milgram study. You might have heard of this. We'll watch this later, kind of at the end of class in social psychology. But this is a famous study. Stanley Milgram had volunteers come in and they were paired up with a partner and they were supposed to learn wordless. But what they didn't know was that their partner was fake and was a recording. And when their partner would get the wordless wrong, they were instructed to deliver an electrical shock. Some of them would deliver an electrical shock that it was indicated to be fatal. So uh, why would that be unethical? Well, think about that. And think about the harm that it might do to the individual. And we, do, we try to do everything that we can do in our power to reduce harm. We don't want there to be any harm. We want there to be benefits from the research. Another famous study is the Stanford Prison Experiment by Philip Zimbardo, where he created a prison in the basement of uh, the psychology building at Stanford. Another very unethical study that would never be done today. There's lots of questions um, about ethics when we talk about research, whether it's psychological or medical. I mean, look at the Tuskegee uh, research studies. Um, even the Nazis were doing horrific things in the name of science. So it's very important that we follow ethical rules. We need to respect the basic rights of humans and animals as well. And that's a fundamental obligation of all researchers. There's a very specific set of rules. And what we have when you propose research are very special committees that are set up 
called institutional review boards. So all research that's proposed is run through an institutional review board to make sure that it's ethical and it's of sound research design. So any researcher out there that's affiliated with some sort of institution is being reviewed by those IRBs or institutional review boards. Informed consent is part of research. So all research participants are asked to sign statements indicating that they've been informed to the potential risks and benefits and that they willingly consent to participate in the study. There's always a risk gain assessment. So uh, some research does involve risk to participants, but we try and minimize it as much as we can. Sometimes research requires intentional deceit or deception. And for some research, it's not possible to tell participants the intention of the study without biasing the results. So there's very strict rules for the use of uh, deception created by the American Psychological Association. And then at the end of every study, participants are always debriefed and they're provided with as much information as possible about the study so they understand what they did. Now, one of the questions, I, I, honestly, I hate asking this question. Um, I've taught outside of the United States. I've taught this class in the Bahamas. Um, if you ask this question in the Bahamas, should animals be used in psychological and medical research? 100% of the hands go up for yes. And in the United States, when I ask this question, it's about 50-50. So a lot of people are very passionate about the use of animals in psychological and medical research. Um, there should be a discussion question this week about that. And I want you to have your own opinions about that, either for or against. But the end goal of all this is that you learn about research. So you don't just take people's opinions for facts. You learn how to interpret data. You can look at studies that are done in like the newspaper or magazines that are done poorly and understand that. Um, oftentimes you'll be presented with products um, on television, maybe like diet pills or you know uh, products intended to relieve pain. Do they work? You can become a wiser consumer of research if you learn these basic tenets of research and the critical thinking skills that are involved, um, if you know how to evaluate claims about what research shows and you understand what a good research study is, it can be very beneficial in your life. I mean, it, it could be very serious too. Um, say you potentially have a disease and you have to evaluate two different treatment options. These skills will help you uh, make the right choices and choices that are rational and based on empirical evidence. That's what this is all about. So if you have any questions, contact me. Um, I know this is a hard chapter and these are hard things to understand. Um, there's also videos posted um, about research methods and the psychology. I want you to watch those. Um, but that should get you through this chapter and you should understand the material uh, at this point.